Welcome back to another episode of the Past Story Podcast. This week, we are talking about a new study that has come out around the topic of celiac disease, but we are focusing on persistent organic pollutants. So Dr. Pastori, first of all, what is a persistent organic pollutant? Because I've never heard of it before. Yeah, and you know, it's it's been something that's starting to be uh, studied more often, uh, and we're only now learning um, the, the ramifications of these various chemicals. So let's first define it. The World Health Organization defines these chemicals uh, known as POPs as uh, the chemicals that have a long lasting uh, effect on the planet and they can magnify and accumulate in various ecosystems, of course, inside the food chain and definitely inside human beings. Uh, the most commonly encountered persistent organic compounds are what's known as the organochlorine pesticides. Uh, one that stopped its production in the 70s, but still kind of picked up a little bit in the 80s, and then very, very small quantities were made in other countries is known as DDT. Yeah, um, I remember the song. That's where I know it from, because I was born after they had ruled it out. But farmer, farmer, put away the DDT. Yeah, and it was it's a real serious thing, because going way back 20 years ago when I was in internal medicine, I was running a blood test on metabolites of DDT and finding it in people. I actually found it in my wife, uh, who I've been married to for quite some time, but we were just dating at the time where I ran a whole blood test and could find metabolites in my wife's blood. So clearly my wife was born uh, after it was banned. Uh, it should not be in her, in her body. But what we're learning is there's metabolites of these chemicals because they're very long lasting. So even though you stop something in the 70s and 80s, it has a very, very strong progression of still li living in, on our planet and contaminating our soil. And I'll talk a little bit about this is exposures decades and decades like we're in 2020 this is almost 50 years later correct uh these these are real some real serious uh, and that's just one that sadly we are exposed to other ones on a daily basis so if a, if they're finding a problem with a chemical that we stopped making 50 years ago or using right in this country imagine if there's something you're exposed to on a regular basis so continuing that that definition by the world health organization they talk about some of the industrial chemicals and they talk about ones known as pcbs polychlorinated biphenyls um, they talk about other products that are you basically would see in non-stick cookware. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those specific chemicals today. But uh, really a governing theme I hope the audience will, will understand today is there's not one medical establishment. And of course, I'm, I'm referring to the World Health Organization right now, but please understand that also includes data by the Environmental Protection Agency, by the FDA um, here in the United States, the CDC, and of course, Health Canada. Nobody disagrees with the following fact. Persistent organic pollutants are indeed linked to increases in human cancers, reproductive disorders, alterations of the immune system, neurobehavioral um, abnormalities and impairments, endocrine disruption, um, genotoxicity, as well as birth defects. So these, um, unfortunately, our, our relationship with these substances is not good. It is not beneficial, but no one really is taking the time to look at individual disease states and any of these individual chemicals. And that's really what uh, excited me about this, doing this podcast today, is that's finally happening. And that kind of makes me think back to our artificial sweeteners podcast that we did about how consuming these artificial chemicals that our body was never designed to ingest on a regular basis is going to cause negative health effects. So this is obviously on a much more severe scale um, because the chemicals are more harsh, correct? Yeah, the, exactly. The chemicals are more harsh and we do have a larger exposure. And then we have what's known as a chronic exposure. Um, what's so great about someone identifying that they have a sensitivity to one of those aforementioned artificial sweeteners is they can actually put their foot down um, and stop. And unless they are in a manufacturing plant of them without proper respiratory protection, uh, there's no known transdermal absorption. There's no further exposure that they would have. Uh, with these chemicals, we're finding that they can accumulate in places that you wouldn't normally expect. Um, definitely putting even children that are, are in affluent areas and in big cities um, of affluence still at risk, which is a study I'm going to talk about today, uh, for that definitely, these chemicals definitely disrupting their health in the long term. Um, and we are, as I said, and I'm sorry that I have to say this, but it is a fact we are chronically exposed. Uh, I definitely don't want anybody to have a fear factor, but there are some basic steps we can make to reduce our, our quantities 
of exposure to these things to the best of our abilities. And laws are definitely changing on some of the substances I'll talk about today. So at least there are some positive notes, but it should make us all hyper aware, like the basic things, what do we use to cook with, right? Uh, so that should hopefully get people to listen uh, and stay tuned. And is it just ingesting it or can these pops be inhaled? Are they in creams or lotions that we put on or is it strictly coming through the foods? Uh, they can actually be transdermally absorbed. They can be absorbed through the food supply, um, especially through contamination in our own kitchens when it comes to some specific ones. And we'll talk about PFOS and PFOAs, which are uh, chemicals that uh, have very unique properties that um, kind of reject oil and water um, so they can, they're used to form coatings. Um, it's kind of scary though, when you look at the background of these chemicals, you go, wait a minute, that's a flame retardant? So I'm frying my eggs in what is supposed to be a flame retardant so that I can have quicker access or better looking eggs uh, using a pan that has a nonstick coating that is made with harmful chemicals, one of those aforementioned chemicals. So it's really those types of exposures of it becoming in contact with the food plus heat really does magnify the, the absorption that you would have. Interesting. So let's get into this study and yeah. how POPs are related to celiac disease. So yeah. when was it? What's it all about? Yeah, so this is really new, Lexi. This, the, first of all, I wanted to say a little caveat. This, this is a pilot study. So that means this is like the first of its kind and it's very new and we do want more data and I will you know, state some I don't want to say criticisms because I think the work is excellent and we need to have excellent work, but there are some questions, of course, that any researcher would have reading a pilot study and the researchers themselves want us to do more study so we can get even more information, but nobody wants to ignore this right now. So there was a study that was published in the Journal of Environmental Research. It was published just last month on May 11th. Um, and it was titled Persistent Organic Pollutant Exposure in Celiac Disease. And it's a pilot study, as I mentioned. And the lead researcher is Abigail Gaylord, and she did this with colleagues in uh, New York City at a wonderful university known as NYU. Um, so just excellent, excellent research. So what they did was they uh, got 88 patients recruited from NYU Children's Hospital, uh, their outpatient clinic, and 30 of which were absolutely diagnosed with celiac disease using the standard serology and duodenal biopsy as they were doing the study. And what they did was they were looking at specifically the levels of specific POPs, these, uh, these chronic pollutants um, in the blood of these children. They then ran a specific type of statistic analysis, not to throw math into uh, this and bore people, but it's known as a multivariable logistic regression. Uh, and what that helps us do as researchers is control for things, right? You can control for sex and isolate that. You can control for race, you can control for age, you could control for body mass index because we know that a lot of these um, substances really have an affinity for adipose tissue. So the leaner an individual is, the more difficult it is to actually retain these chemicals. Mm -hmm. The more body fat an individual will have, the better bioaccumulation that the individual will have because there's a susceptibility there. But then we also have to throw in the fact that someone could be incredibly lean and have fatty liver and they could have a lot of fat accumulating around their liver. Um, probably the most popular one in both our um, countries is um, non-steroidic uh, hepatitis cirrhosis. It's a non-alcoholic um, cirrhosis where you can have fatty liver from non-alcohol means, and it's typically associated with insulin resistance, which we talk a whole podcast about. So just excess carbohydrate and glucose intake um, can hyperaccumulate in certain individuals, triglycerides, which just get stored and processed in the liver creating an area for retention for these toxic chemicals. Um, so after they stratified for all the aforementioned characteristics, particularly for sex, they found higher odds, odds of celiac disease in young girls that had higher serum concentrations of a specific um, pop known as DEE, um, dichlorodiphenol dichloroethylene, DDE, that's going to be a great one for the show notes, by the way, Lexi. I'm going to Google that. It's like 30 letters. Uh, so <laughs> so DEE, DDE, thank goodness. Uh, there was actually a, an increased uh, risk for developing celiac disease in young girls just being exposed to that chemical. Um, in, in now, both with that sector. being said, there's a higher risk when they carry the gene. So for those that have never listened to any of our previous podcasts, you need to have the genetic variance 
in order to be able to develop celiac disease. And if you do not have these genes, you're never going to have celiac disease. So this is the girls that had the genetics for it, plus were exposed to this pop that then went on to develop celiac disease. 100%. And thank you, Lexi. It's so important that we clarify that. You can't magically develop HLA, DQ2.5, DQ8, okay? That's just not going to happen. So the children that had these genes, they noticed a higher incidence of celiac disease. Now, just so you know, some background on DDE, um, there's evidence that it has an adverse impact on the immune system. Um, there's very strong scientific evidence by the FDA and EPA that it has uh, act as a strong endocrine disruptor. And we talked about that category when we did a sunscreen um, episode talking about endocrine disruptors. So what's really kind of scary here about this chemical for me when I was reading this paper and reading the materials and methods was, well, uh, DDE is not something we use in commercial uh, environment work anymore. It's not something that's being manufactured on a regular basis. It's a byproduct metabolite of the breakdown of DDT. So we know DDE proves that DDT is degrading slowly on the planet. Um, keep in mind that the United States uh, actually was making a decline from like 82 million kilograms in the early 60s uh, down to around 2 million kilograms by like 71 when I was just a wee lad. Uh, and then smaller quantities of DDT were actually produced for export as late as, as the 80s. So, so we're, we're really talking about that. young girls here that have definitely been born after the year 2000. Yep. So how is this chemical that was around in the 70s getting passed on to them? Yes, it's being degraded and turned into a different form, but how are they coming into contact with it? Yeah, it's it's really the, the big question here. and. Um, it, it's found in everything from dust samples to water runoff um, from industrialized areas to where farms have been sprayed in the past, but they're not organic farms and they just don't have any complete flipping over of the soil and changing of the soil and the five years without a pesticide to be actually labeled as an organic farm. So just traditional farming can still give some retention of these chemicals, sadly, um, our planet has a memory and it retains these things that we use on a regular basis. And just like when we're putting garbage in our body and we're expecting to snap back very quickly, dumping this type of garbage on our planet has um, shown us more often than not that there are long lasting ramifications of memory of these chemicals and these metabolites of these chemicals on the planet. And, and the I'm reason this is- that this study was done at NYU. So yeah. these children were living in New York City, which is a highly, highly populated- yeah. city environment where you're exposed to way more pollutants than if you were living in the middle of a farm town. You are 100% correct. Uh, so that and that's where, you know, I met my wife and tested her and sure enough, she, she showed up positive for one of these chemicals. It actually was DDE, by the way, that was in my wife's blood 15 years ago. Um, so clearly, we, it, it is more omnipresent than we think. And please also understand that, you know, nanogram quantities of this substance are uh, harmful. Um, so you may say, well, okay, with this one chemical, what's the, the statistical significance for, for these young women, these young girls? Well, it actually was two times the risk. So having the gene doesn't absolutely say you're going to get the disease, um, but this showed in this one pilot trial, which I, will, I promise I will critique a little bit after I finish some talks of some of the chemicals, um, it, it shows in this one pilot study that there was two time increased risk that individuals that went on to develop celiac disease, maybe not have celiac disease um, later on in life, um, they're still gonna be following up on these cases and more studies will be coming. But it was, it's kind of scary to just think out of a sample of, of 88, the ones with the highest levels of these chemicals had the greatest incidence of the disease in a short period of time. Yeah, one of the things that you mentioned there was it contributes to a pro-inflammatory response and triggers yes. the immune system and celiac yeah. is an autoimmune disease. So if your immune system is responding to a chemical that it was never designed to ingest, that can flip on the switch for celiac, correct? That's, that's the thinking, yeah. We definitely think there's external stimuli and we've seen it before. We've seen some infections, like some people have had uh, Giardia um, infections from travel had the celiac genes happen to visit a population where they were consuming an enormous amount of gluten, all of that at the same exact time, and then having the infection actually ripened, so to speak, their immune system for all out attack. What's harmful with these chemicals is it's this quiet immune system provocation. 
from them that we're, we're not seeing. It's, it's invisible. And then you have that with a normal stimuli environment of the exposure to gluten, which I think we all agree is omnipresent in this society. And unless you are in the know of being a, an individual diagnosed with a disease, um, your exposure will continue. So being the gene carrier and then having what they're saying, this immune system upregulation due to these chemicals is turning on a higher risk factor uh, for this disease. And, I'm, and we could take it so much further. Like I'm wondering who then could develop small intestinal cancer since these chemicals are indeed associated with genetic error um, that can lead to cell replication not be normal, which is basically what cancer is, right? Cancer isn't an infection you get from an organism, it's made from within you. And it has to do with your uh, genetic abnormalities that are multifactorial. I give a three and a half hour lecture just on the microbiology of cancer and that cut off back in 2005 and I didn't miss one pathway and I spoke very rapidly for over three hours. So that obviously has continued, that's 15 year old lecture. Um, we know so many more genetic pathways, but these are definitely stimulatory agents. Um, further in this research, what we identified was two other chemicals that are, I, I would like to say, more known um, in the population. I'm seeing a lot more cooking wear labeling that they're free of at least one of these. So young girls, again, had greater odds of celiac disease associated with serum levels of a chemical known as PFOS. Um, that's a perfluorooctanonic acid. And then another one known as PFOA. Uh, so these chemicals are typically found in non-stick cooking uh, equipment like frying pans and the stuff that lines other types of fast cooking uh, substances, grills that you use to um, sear food and drain off the fat. Any of the coating of a non-stick can potentially can, uh, contain these chemicals unless it's clearly labeled that it does not have these chemicals. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting and, and people need to be aware of that. So let's quote another great group and the Environmental Protection Agency states that these chemicals are one, not naturally found in the environment. They're used in a variety of industrial and consumer products. And the reasons why is because they repel oil and they repel water. So we see them in surface protection products like carpets, clothing treatments, coatings for papers, cardboard and packing, even found in some leather products. They're known as surfactants in industrial work. Um, some people use plumber's tape, plumber's tape to, to tighten the joints between the water in your own home could actually have these, these chemicals found in them. Um, but the number one source really is nonstick coatings and cookware, um, membranes for clothing that are supposed to be waterproof. So more like active wear for someone going out and doing a lot of hiking in inclement weather. Um, hunters might be exposed to this type of, of stuff. Um, but we do find them again in domestic like wiring. That's less of a risk factor unless it's an old building being rebuilt, which is a big problem in New York. So it's the chronic exposure to construction, the fallout of the buildings, breaking these things down, um, having plumbing redone with the, this type of plumbing thread seal uh, that has these chemicals. And then of course, just cooking. Uh, so what did we learn? According to the EPA, these substances are absolutely what we call bioaccumulatable. You're exposed to it, you store it, you then use it again, or you're exposed to it, you store it, and it builds up over time. And it's the building up over time that seems to have a stimulatory effect on our bodies, not just immunologically, but it too is linked to cancers, um, and it's stored specifically in the liver and in the kidneys. So that was another scary one. And we found that when individuals, the, these, these young people were exposed to this, they increased their risk for celiac disease as well. Now, um, with the nonstick cooking industry, that is not regulated, right? Like the Food and Drug Administration does not have control over the frying pan and baking sheet industry being like, no, you can't put that on your pan. It's not safe for people, right? Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's more of, Right now, there's no legal action on these chemicals because I do see it. Uh, after I read this study, I just started looking at pans and sure enough, you could find the ones that list where PFOA free um, or where PFOS free. Both of those, of course, is what you want to look for when you're shopping for a pan. I could tell you well before this study, that's what I've had in my own home. Um, I've never would use anything that had those chemicals, just knowing what they were studying toxicology. But now seeing an association between my own disease really is, is quite fascinating. 
and it definitely is a risk factor. But yes, to answer your question, unless we, we have a definitive answer, uh, which I think we do, uh, the FDA is really slow to act on these things. And I've never heard of any law um, to date on these chemicals being banned. Um, some are, as we know with DDT, but definitely these chemicals are not at this time. And I do think there's a lot of indus industry pushback. There's a lot of lobbying. Uh, these laws are very, very slow to change. I mean, look, for the love of God, cigarettes are legal. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, that's like, we know it kills people, but it's legal. We know secondhand exposure kills people, but it's legal. So I think there's, there's a lot of slow um, action on these specific points. Um, what's also interesting about this study, and we do know in general, all auto, autoimmune diseases are, have a predominance in, in women um, by, by genetic, the way the laws of genes work. Uh, but for, for the boys in this study, there definitely were greater odds of celiac disease associated with the chemical known as hexabromodiphenyl ether. Um, it's abbreviated DBE-153. Um, and it's also in a class of synthetic chemicals that were first commercially available in the 70s. And they're added to products like pa uh, foam padding and textiles and plastics to retard combustion. So a lot of flame retardants. Um, the FDA did act here and they were asked to uh, phase out these chemicals by like 2004. Um, there was a rule to prevent new products being made with these chemicals by 2005. But here's the problem. They are persistent pollutants. So they're still building up in the environment just where they are. I mean, I'm glad you talked about New York because it's where I was born and raised and spent the majority of my life. And I can't even tell you how often there would be a completely, an old building being redone. And my first apartment in New York City on Park Avenue with my wife when we were married, uh, I think our building, our brownstone was built in 1890 because I remember seeing some, some brickwork that had those dates. So we're talking some serious old construction and then those buildings are rebuilt. And I mean, how much protection can you really do with regard to knocking these things down in the environment? And we've seen this with asbestos and I've been involved in asbestos clear, clearing of, of various offices and they put up the warning signs and the big plastic, but can we be honest, is anyone standing there with a meter trying to detect how much is billowing into the environment? Um, they're not. And as a matter of fact, the, the two main sources for this, this chemical that affected these boys, the uh, uh, BDE-153, um, is, is basically drains that leach from a landfill and dust. Well, you know, if you ever had an apartment in New York, it's amazing how you keep it meticulously clean and then you have all this dust just appear, especially living up really high. We would see an accumulation of, of basically pollution or soot uh, because it's such a polluted area. By the way, it's, it hurts me to throw stones at my beloved city. I love New York City. I just I chose not to reside there any further. Um, but uh, yeah, so you're and you're right, Lexi. Every single individual from this trial were uh, local residents that were outpatients living in the state of New York. Now, were levels you said about 30, 33 of them had celiac disease from the eighty roughly that were eighty eight? Yeah, yeah. So. For the other roughly 50 children that were tested, they still had high levels of these POPs that were being tested for? Uh, detectable levels. Uh, it really was the, the highest levels were found in the individuals that um, had the genes and went on to have celiac disease, which is what gave the, the study one component of statistical significance. So they were able to see um, in their mind at this point in time, and I do have some criticisms and I promise I'll get to it, uh, at their moment in time, um, a rate of chemical exposure and in retention with gene presence and incidence of celiac disease. Yeah. So that's one of the significances. Are there any other things in the study that jumped out that you want to make yeah. listeners aware of? Yeah, definitely. So, so this is the first study that ever reported um, celiac disease with these persistent um, chemicals in, in, in our environment and, and particularly exposure in children at risk for celiac disease. And I think these, these findings raise further questions on how environmental chemicals can affect autoimmunity in genetic susceptible individuals. And I think that's a very important dialogue we can't stop, right? There's a, there's a, a horrible saying in the outer boroughs or anyone who's ever lived in a house that had um, a cockroach inf infestation uh, is if you turn on the lights in your kitchen and you see one roach on the floor, you have more behind the walls. So right now they showed us something on the floor and I wanna know what else is coexisting in there. 
and I want to know what other chemicals can play similar roles because there are so many cousin chemicals. If you really dive into just the few that I mentioned, uh, you pull up enormous PDFs from the government on all the metabolites and secondary chemicals. And these individuals went to painstaking um, lengths to just test these, these few. Uh, it is a controversial subject, right? Because then you want to point fingers at who to blame. Um, but this is a byproduct of modern industrialization um, and, and the growth and progress and flame retardants and actually putting, uh, saving lives from not having fires everywhere. So basically it's kind of like putting out a fire over here for now to then have some small fires elsewhere. And I'm referring to various genetic abnormalities associated with these flame retardants. So I definitely think that those are um, significant conversations that we need to have. And by conversations, I mean clinical peer-reviewed published study to, to weigh the hypothesis that I'm, that I'm raising now. And like you said, this is only the first study of hopefully many to come on this topic, whether it's just POPs alone or POPs and connected with celiac disease or other right. autoimmune diseases. So with this first study, you said there are a couple of weaknesses that you wanted to point out. Yeah. What would you recommend that they change or what should people do in the future when they're doing studies? I'll tell you what's not there, and it kind of blew me away because we learned uh, over the last few years, and we talked about it on this podcast, that withholding or controlling gluten exposure in the at-risk population truncates the risk for celiac disease at an early age. So and that's, to yeah. summarize that statement, the less gluten that you consume, the lower your risk of developing celiac disease. That is what we're seeing in clinical literature. That's the path I'm taking with my own daughter. Before the even study was published, my daughter was you know, here. And then it, when it came about, I loved running to my wife and saying, I was right. Uh, at least I believed right. And, and everybody's endorsed that, that paper, by the way, um, which was a very large study. And some of the, the heroes in the world of celiac disease, Joseph Murray, Alessio Fasano, um, Peter Green, all agreed that that was a real smart, logical path to take. When, by the way, that was ignored in the past. So, so what, am I, what am I saying here, Lexi? Well, I was kind of shocked to see in this study, we identified in New York where some of the best celiac institutions are, uh, children that have the risk factors for celiac disease, and we did not measure gluten exposure. There were no questions. There was no dialogue with the parents, the school system. What's the food environment like? These aren't old enough kids running off and you know buying pizza on the corner. There's controlled environments. It's a pediatric population. Are we able to identify um, the gluten exposure risk factors how, what was the frequency of tissue transglutaminase measurements, et cetera. Um, that I feel is probably one of the biggest portholes because we could say the chemical was the straw of the iceberg because there happened to be a set of pool subjects that were at risk for celiac disease that had an extremely high gluten intake. That's a big deal. To, because celiac disease is a genetic disease, the mother has celiac disease and is following a strict gluten-free diet, her child would be less exposed, I'm assuming, to gluten compared to two parents that are unaware of it. And then their child is still undiagnosed. So they're all eating gluten, which is a daily thing. It adds up over weeks. And then all of a sudden, boom, symptoms show up and your kid's diagnosed with celiac disease. Absolutely. And that's, and that's like, so I really feel that's the biggest weakness. And then we should, we should do the, a larger study and we should randomize it. We should have a larger number of controls, uh, kind of like the prior studies that I've been talking about, where we're looking at like 45,000 subjects versus 166,000 with inflammatory bowel disease and, and then doing a cross reference and then using healthy control. So I really feel, and I, and I do know some of my colleagues have similar um, points because I talked to one this afternoon who shared that point. And the first point we brought up was what was the gluten consumption like? So that's something we need to repeat. Um, having said that, I want to make it very clear with respect to uh, Gaylord and colleagues. Uh, I, I, co I commend them on this excellent work. I think this is a great first pilot study. Um, I beg uh, that we continue uh, to do to look in this area because it's it's something that we're all stuck around with uh, for, for the foreseeable future. And with these persistent organic pollutants, like you said, they're kind of hard to avoid entirely. They're yeah. in the air. If you're living in highly populated cities or areas, they're going to be more difficult to avoid. They're in clothing. But what are your recommendations for people that are like, whoa, 
what yeah. can I do to protect myself from this as much as possible? Yeah. And you know, in, in my humble opinion, I don't want to be an alarmist in any way, uh, but I do believe let's control what we can control. So I really believe that while we're waiting for more data, very similar to our conversation on sunscreen in that podcast, while we're waiting for more data, I can't see any harm to being proactive and saying, what am I cooking with for my at-risk celiac disease population? And if I had it my way, for anyone in any household who would love to avoid a disease, do, does my nonstick cookware have any of these harmful chemicals? And if so, I should discard those and purchase ones who do not, that do not. Yes, I think that's a great first step. Um, and then of course, if you wanted to go further, you could just look at where you live. And I'm not asking anyone to move, but look at where you live and what can you do to protect yourself, right? Is there real old wiring, old plumbing, anything that could be adjusted slowly over time? Um, there's some people who are exposed to some chemicals that are not on this topic, but um, some are like they're using vapor barriers to prevent the inhalation of chemicals when there's renovation going on adjacent to you. There's no harm in taking those types of proactive steps. But I really believe the biggest change someone could make is something they're doing every day, especially in the, the light of these times of COVID-19 where people are really cooking regular meals is at least controlling the cookware you're using. And then maybe it makes you think even about eating out at a restaurant or any harmful substances being used. And then think about having one of these pans that you're using that may have these harmful chemicals, are they flecked? Are they old? Are they weathered? These chemicals don't last forever. There's no such thing as a perfectly functioning nonstick pan for all eternity. They basically have a half-life of like, what, six months to 12 months, depending on the use, and they're constantly degrading. So if you're ever wondering, why is my nonstick pan no longer as nonstick as it once was? Because you're actually eating parts that, were, that, that, that made it nonstick in the first place and we're not excreting them very well. And when people are looking to buy nonstick cooking ware, what is the labels one more time that they should be looking for? Yeah, and so first it does help to look for like green ware is, and by the way, this is omnipresent and very cost effective. You know, I picked mine up at like local Bed Bath & Beyonds and you can find it at Costco's and the Amazon and they have it. They clearly state that it's free of PFOS and PFOA and they may continue to talk about the dialogue that they do not use toxic chemicals in the production or any other chemicals in the production for their nonstick uh, coating. And it's so important to, to look at those chemicals and, and, and just say, I'd like to just avoid that as best as possible, particularly for the celiac disease community. And look, you may even say, well, it may pan out that there's no direct connection, but please let me state governing bodies, the World Health Organization, Health Canada, um, the United States Centers for Disease Control, um, FDA, EPA, they're all saying these chemicals are not great for you and they're persistent and they absolutely do things immunologically. So then logic would say, why not do everything I can to try to reduce my exposure to the best of my ability? And you have me taking action now because I have nonstick pans. I have lots of them and I <laughs> for celiac disease, but for those of you that have listened in the past, I've been tested, I am negative, I want to stay negative, even though I am gluten intolerant, um, but I am going to go check out some PFOA and PFOS free or non-stick pans as awesome. soon as we get off this call, <laughs> do some replacing in my kitchen. That's awesome, I'm so glad I have some benefit in your life. <laughs> So if you guys have any questions about celiac disease or POPs or anything that we've covered or things you want us to cover in the future, feel free to reach out to us. We are here to communicate with you. We appreciate all of your feedback. Every single person that reaches out, shout out to Leah who left a review this past month. Thank you so much. We're so happy that Dr. Pastore could help you understand what celiac disease is. Uh, but continue to educate yourself through these podcasts, through his articles, through social media. Dr. Pastore's website is drrobertpastore.com. He's on social at Dr. Robert Pastore. And we will be back next week with another episode on the Pastore podcast. Thank you so much for listening.